Welcome to the fourth segment on metabolic myopathies. To this point, we have covered errors in the breakdown of carbohydrate and fats to generate acetyl-CoA. We now turn our focus to the continued metabolism of acetyl-CoA by considering errors in the citric acid cycle as well as in the electron transport chain. These are known as the mitochondrial myopathies. As with the previous two segments, we will reflect on our foundational understanding of cellular respiration to explain the presentation pattern seen with mitochondrial myopathies. The term mitochondrial myopathy makes reference to any inborn error of metabolism related to enzymes associated with either the citric acid cycle or electron transport chain. These proteins are coded by genes associated with either the nuclear or mitochondrial genome. As a result, mitochondrial myopathies can show either an autosomal inheritance pattern or a maternal inheritance pattern from acquiring a mitochondrial gene mutation directly from the mother. In the case of mutations related to the mitochondrial genome, the inheritance pattern can be homoplasmic, meaning that all of the inherited mitochondria have the same mutation. Alternatively, if only a fraction of the mitochondria had the mutation, the individual would be considered heteroplasmic. This has important implications as heteroplasmic individuals would be expected to have milder symptoms when compared to those in which all mitochondria are affected. This, combined with the variety of genes that can be affected, add to the complexity of this family of disorders. It is also important to realize that this is not, strictly speaking, a muscle disease, as any tissue that relies on some degree of aerobic metabolism is expected to be affected. Mitochondrial myopathies tend to be the most debilitating of the metabolic syndromes, as it represents the common metabolic pathway that both glycolysis and lipolysis feed into. With glycogen storage diseases and fatty acid oxidation myopathies, the patient can modify their diets to become more reliant on the alternative energy source for cellular respiration. With mitochondrial myopathies, this is not an option. And because of the large degree of variability within this patient population, it can be difficult to properly diagnose. If you had to describe a quote-unquote typical patient with a mitochondrial myopathy, they would demonstrate a generalized exercise intolerance that would not improve over the course of the activity, as we see with the glycogen storage diseases. The patient would struggle with other forms of metabolic stress, such as illnesses. To compensate for generalized energy deficiencies, the body would need to rely heavily on anaerobic glycolysis as its primary source of energy. Therefore, there is typically a chronic elevation in blood lactate, even at rest. The one finding that is not seen as commonly in mitochondrial myopathies is rhabdomyolysis. Making diagnoses in mitochondrial myopathies is a complex undertaking that requires a number of steps and tests. Often, a metabolic myopathy, but not necessarily a mitochondrial myopathy, is suspected and a forearm exercise test is requested. In contrast to a glycogen storage disease, an elevated blood lactate at rest is a strong indicator of a mitochondrial myopathy. This finding may only occur in 35% of those with mitochondrial myopathy, but the test is highly specific with only a 10% false positive rate. Plasma alanine can also be elevated in this population, particularly in the period following physical activity. Once a mitochondrial myopathy is suspected, the forearm exercise test can be performed or repeated with analysis of venous blood gases. This increases the complexity of the test and is not generally performed unless a mitochondrial myopathy is suspected. Under normal circumstances, the forearm exercise test will cause a transient increase in the rate of oxygen consumption through the electron transport chain and in carbon dioxide production through the citric acid cycle. This results in a predictable decrease in oxygen and increase in carbon dioxide in the blood collected from the active muscle beds. These findings are attenuated with mitochondrial myopathies and a strong indicator for the presence of this disease. A progressive exercise test might also be ordered in the early phases of diagnosis, but has very low specificity 
as sedentary individuals typically also have low values of oxygen consumption. The next step is typically a histological analysis of a muscle biopsy. The most characteristic finding is the presence of a so-called ragged red fiber with Gomori trichome straining, which is the result of mitochondrial aggregates just deep to the sarcolemma. Special analysis of the tissue with electron microscopy may help to identify misshapen mitochondria. These aggregates provide a rich source of mitochondrial DNA that can be analyzed for genetic mutations known to cause mitochondrial myopathies. As with the other metabolic myopathies, there are no cures for mitochondrial myopathies and treatment options are limited. Creatine supplementation may assist with activities requiring a quick burst of energy. Other supplements may also assist with specific myopathies. In the case of mutations within complex one of the electron transport chain, boosting endogenous levels of succinate and riboflavin may help to shuttle electrons directly into complex two. Similarly, supplementation with cytochrome Q10 may boost the body's ability to bypass mutations to complex two. MRF syndrome is a term used to identify a collection of mutations within the mitochondrial genome that produce a similar presentation pattern. The name was coined from an acronym used to describe the findings of myoclonic epilepsy and ragged red fibers commonly associated with this condition. Symptoms may begin at any age, with the first finding typically being myoclonus or involuntary muscle jerks. Other less consistent findings related to the effects on both muscle and the nervous system include seizures, loss of coordinated body movements, and myopathy. In later stages, the patient may also develop peripheral neuropathies, muscle spasticity, deafness, and optic atrophy. A second family of related conditions also gets its name from the clinical presentation pattern. Milis syndrome is characterized by mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. Again, mutations associated with this condition are typically associated with the mitochondrial genome and include the gene coding for complex one of the electron transport chain, but the presentation is distinct from that for Mirth syndrome. Symptoms generally manifest sometime in childhood and may include muscle pain, weakness, and seizures. Patients with MELIS typically experience stroke-like episodes prior to the age of 40. The exact incidence of MELIS in MRF in the general population is unclear, but collectively, the mitochondrial myopathies are thought to affect one in four to 5,000 individuals. That concludes our discussion of the metabolic myopathies. In the final segment, we will put the pieces together to develop a systematic approach in recognizing and diagnosing the metabolic myopathies.